Welcome back. On December 28th, 1879, the world's longest bridge, the Firth of Tay Bridge in Scotland, collapsed in a gale, killing all 75 occupants of a train that was crossing the bridge at that moment. This tragedy would trigger a series of events that dramatically altered the course of bridge design in both Britain and the US, while focusing attention on the role of the engineer as never before. It would also prompt the design and construction of two of the world's great structures. Our story begins in the 1850s in Scotland on the North British Railway line from Edinburgh to Dundee. Now, Dundee is only 46 miles north of Edinburgh, but between these cities are two broad firths or estuaries that extend inland from the North Sea. Both the Firth of Tay and the Firth of Forth are relatively shallow but quite wide. In those days, a traveler on the Edinburgh to Dundee route had to endure a rather arduous journey, a train from Edinburgh to Granton, a paddle wheel ferry across the Firth of Forth, another train to Tayport, another ferry across the Firth of Tay, and then finally the train to Dundee. As a result, North British began losing business to a competing railway that connected the same two cities by a single circuitous rail line to the west. The only way for North British to regain its competitive edge was to bridge the two firths. This idea was first proposed in 1854 by Thomas Bausch, the North Brit British Railway's chief engineer. There were many opponents, but the railway eventually obtained royal assent to build the bridges in 1870 and construction began the following year. The Two Mile Tay Bridge was a series of 85 simply supported iron trusses on cast iron piers. The 11 longest spans, each 245 feet long, were located in the center of the navigation channel. These were called the high girders. Using modern terminology, they were through trusses rather than deck trusses because the train passed through the truss rather than on top of it, as shown here. These high girders provided greater clearance for ships passing underneath, and that was an essential accommodation to the shipping interests that had opposed the project. The remaining spans used deck trusses because these would require shorter piers and so would cost less. Although none of the individual spans of this bridge were of record length, the bridge as a whole was the longest in the world upon its completion in 1878. One year later, Queen Victoria knighted Thomas Bausch for his achievement. Six months later, Bausch's triumph turned to tragedy as all 11 high girders collapsed during a gale, taking 75 souls with them. In the official inquiry that followed, Sir Thomas Bausch was held responsible for the collapse, for failing, failing to adequately account for wind loads in his design. Well, planning for a new Tay Bridge began shortly after the disaster, and a far more robust structure with much heavier trusses and piers opened in 1887. But this structure only solved half of North British Railway's problem. The equally daunting Firth of Forth still prevented a single continuous rail link. Before the Tay Bridge disaster, Thomas Bausch had been working on the design for a suspension bridge over the Firth of Forth. But when the Tay Bridge fell, the railroad's confidence in Bausch collapsed as well, and the suspension bridge plan was abandoned. In 1881, the railway board invited its consulting engineer, John Fowler, to submit a new design. Fowler and his talented assistant, Benjamin Baker, became the principal engineers for the project. Fowler and Baker decided to design the bridge as a cantilever truss. Now recall that the term cantilever actually originated as a construction technique used by James Eads to build his great arch bridge over the Mississippi River at St. Louis. To refresh your memory, let me show you what that technique looked like. During construction, Eads supported the incomplete arches from either end of the span using temporary stay cables that were attached to temporary towers out here at the ends of the span, like this. As each new segment of the arch was added during construction, 
it was attached to the end of the existing construction, and then new stay cables were added in order to tie the arch back to the temporary support structure, thereby allowing the structure to be completed without the use of temporary centering as we saw in other types of arch structures. He's referred to this manner of construction as the canted lever, and the name stuck. In this case, canted is referring to the inclination or tilt of the, uh, of the incomplete construction. Over time, the term cantilever was then applied to any structural element with one unsupported end, as you see here. The cantilever truss, then, is just one variation on this theme. Let's see how that works. First, we'll get our cantilever construction out of the way. And now let's build a cantilever truss. Now, the most common configuration for cantilever bridges is one that has four supports. Two exterior supports, as shown here. These are called abutments. And then two interior supports, or intermediate supports, which are called piers. Before we actually build the cantilever bridge, though, let me show you what the two alternative truss configurations that could also be used to span this gap would look like. The first alternative would be to actually span the entire distance with three independent, simply supported spans. This would be the equivalent of the Tay Bridge that we just saw. So we might place these short, simply supported spans out here on the ends, and then a longer, simple span between the two intermediate supports. The key characteristic of this system, of course, is that all three spans are essentially independent of each other, and they're all simply supported. This isn't an advantageous system because it's easy to design. The problem is that it's not really structurally efficient enough for very long spans. And, and the span that we're talking about here uh, at the Firth of Forth is on the order of 1,700 feet. A simply supported span simply wouldn't have worked. An alternative, then, would be the continuous span. So let's replace our simply supported trusses with a continuous truss. This now is one single structure that spans from one abutment all the way out to the other, passing over the two intermediate supports. The continuous span is far more structurally efficient than the series of simply supported spans. It's structurally efficient for exactly the same reasons that a continuous beam was more efficient than a series of simply supported beams. We talked about that back in our lesson on beams. The continuous bridge is efficient because as a result of these intermediate supports, it tends to bend concave downward over the supports, concave upward in the center, and that balancing of moments between positive and negative turns out to be significantly more efficient. The problem is that this bridge is very difficult to design and analyze, and that would have been particularly important in the era that we're talking about, which was really the dawn of the era of science-based design when computational tools were still uh, relatively primitive. And so designing a structure of this complexity resulting from its continuity would have been an extreme challenge. The other problem with the continuous truss configuration is that it's highly vulnerable to expand problems with expansion, contraction, and support settlement. Let's say that this support here dropped a few inches or that the bridge dropped with respect to that support. The movement of a support underneath a continuous bridge will cause the bridge itself to bend. And therefore, we could see significant stresses being developed in the structure even before any loads are applied. And that is potentially problematic and would have been a reason why engineers of the era would have been reluctant to use the continuous bridge. Now, with those two structural configurations as points of comparison, let's look at the cantilever. To build our cantilever bridge, we're going to start by putting two spans out on the ends. One here, and one on the opposite side. Each of these end spans actually is typically referred to in terms of two components. The component out here on the outside is called the anchor arm, and the component on the inside is called the cantilever arm. And indeed, this is the reason why the bridge configuration is called a cantilever. It is the fact that the cantilever arm of the end span is indeed unsupported.
Now, in a moment, I'm going to complete the structure by putting what's called a suspended span right here in the center. But I think you can see, now that you've developed a fine appreciation for the principle of equilibrium, that as soon as I hang a span out here in the middle, the whole structure is going to tip over and fall into the middle of the, of the river. So an integral uh, aspect of the design of a cantilever bridge is that it requires some sort of counterweight out here on the anchor spans. They need to be anchored to the abutments in order to counterbalance the additional weight that we're about to add with our suspended span. So here is our suspended span. And the other critical ca characteristic of the cantilever that you need to recognize as I'm attaching it is that the attachment between the suspended span and the cantilever arms of the end spans is done entirely with this pair of pinned connections. And so what we really have in the center span is, for all intents and purposes, a simply supported truss. That's really important because that principal limitation of the continuous bridge, that is its susceptibility to additional stresses caused by support settlements, simply isn't an issue with a cantilever. Note that if this support moves, the bridge is articulated, so it's able to accommodate that movement without any difficulty at all as a result of the two hinges that exist in the middle of the span. And while it does have this favorable quality, it still has essentially the same level of structural efficiency as the continuous bridge does, because it still has that characteristic of bending in negative curvature over the supports and in positive curvature out near the center of the span. As a result of these advantages, many cantilever tr trusses were built throughout the US and Britain in the latter half of the 19th century. So, why did Fowler and Baker choose to use a cantilever for the first of fourth bridge? Well, first, the British had historically shunned suspension bridges for railroads, as we saw last lecture. And though all of the cantilevers built prior to that time were actually much shorter than the longest suspension bridges, the cantilevers seemed to offer the potential for longer spans. Also, the proposed site of the fourth bridge was well suited for a cantilever. The narrowest point on that stretch of the Firth had an island in the middle of the channel. And because of poor soil conditions, it would have been very difficult to put piers out in the middle of the channel as they were with the Tay Bridge. And so that configuration was less than ideal. A suspension bridge would have been possible, but remember that that was the configuration that the discredited Thomas Bausch had been working on when the Tay Bridge fell. And so it was really publicly unacceptable to bridge the Firth of Forth with a suspension bridge. Nonetheless, this site would require two spans of approximately 1,700 feet each, an unprecedented length. The world's longest span at that time, Roebling's almost completed Brooklyn Bridge, was over 100 feet shorter. There was another important reason why a suspension bridge wasn't an option for the Firth of Forth, public relations. By the late 1800s, the sad history of suspension bridge failures in windstorms was well known. In the aftermath of the Tay Bridge collapse, the public wouldn't have accepted a bridge that was perceived as being vulnerable to wind-induced failure. Recognizing the importance of public confidence to the success of the project, Baker embarked on a vigorous public relations campaign, even before construction began. Through a series of public lectures, he attempted to convince the world that this new structure would be fundamentally different from the failed Tay Bridge. As part of this publicity campaign, Baker created this ingenious visual representation of the cantilever system that would be used on the fourth bridge, constructed entirely with human beings. The two men on the outside represent the piers, and their arms are the upper tension cords of the cantilever arm and the anchor arm. The diagonal wooden struts down below represent the lower compression cords of those arms. The man in the center is seated on the suspended span, and those stacks of bricks out at the outer ends represent the counterbalancing of the anchor spans to maintain equilibrium, as I just showed you on my model. Baker's efforts were quite successful, and they generated considerable public interest in this bridge. Construction began in 1883, and the monumental scale of this structure soon became apparent. When the bridge was completed in 1890, each of its two 1,700-foot spans qualified as the longest in the world.
Based on Baker's famous human cantilever model, we tend to think of the bridge in terms of this structural unit, a pier, a cantilever arm, and an anchor arm. But the actual bridge is composed of three such units with two suspended spans in between. The Firth of Fourth Bridge provides us with a wonderful opportunity to see and understand structure. The piers, the cantilever arms, the anchor arms, and the suspended spans are all perfectly shaped for their structural purpose. The piers spread outward at their bases to provide stability with respect to wind loads, just like the Eiffel Tower. The profile of the main truss is deepest over the piers and in the center of the suspended span where the maximum internal moments are likely to occur, just as we saw in those girders of the modern raft Sundet Bridge in Norway. With the memory of the Tay Bridge disaster still fresh in the public mind, Fowler and Baker designed the fourth bridge not just to be the world's strongest bridge, but also to look like the world's strongest bridge. Its individual structural elements are almost inconceivably large. For example, the bottom cords of the cantilever arms are steel tubes 12 feet in diameter. The fourth bridge was also the world's first structure to be made entirely of steel. Fowler and Baker decided to use this material not only because it was 50% stronger than wrought iron, but also because it provided yet another distinction between their design and the Tay Bridge, which was made of both wrought and cast iron. Opinions about the aesthetics of this structure are sharply divided. Professor David Billington from Princeton University, an expert on the subject of bridge aesthetics, regards the fourth bridge as a work of art. William Morris, an influential 19th century artist and writer, called it, quote, the supremest specimen of ugliness, end quote. Some contemporary engineers also criticized it as structurally excessive, essentially so robust that it was inefficient and wasteful. Indeed, the Firth of Fourth Bridge is often cited not only as the world's strongest bridge, but also as the world's most expensive bridge. But from the perspective of the North British Railway, I think it's fair to say that money was no object. As Thomas Bausch learned, you can't put a price tag on public trust. What's more, the high cost of the structure proved to be a wise long-term investment. Even today, this great bridge carries 200 trains per day across the Firth of Forth. And beautiful or not, it's hard to imagine a more beautiful marriage of form, function, and structure. Now, one of those contemporary engineers who criticized the Fourth Bridge was a prominent American engineer named Theodore Cooper. Cooper had earned his civil engineering degree at Rensselaer Institute in 1858, and after serving in the Navy during the Civil War, he was hired by James Eads to work on the St. Louis Bridge. Cooper started as an inspector, but soon worked his way up to be the on-site construction supervisor for the project. In that role, he earned a reputation for thoroughness and good judgment. On one occasion, during an on-site inspection, Cooper spotted some cracks in one of the main arch tubes of the bridge. Recognizing the seriousness of the situation, he immediately took action to stabilize the arch, and then he telegraphed Eads, who was in New York at the time, to request guidance. Eads was able to diagnose the problem and send instructions to fix it, but it was really Cooper's quick response that averted a, a major crisis. 35 years later, a similar incident would occur on a different bridge project, this time with Cooper in the role of chief engineer, but with a much less favorable outcome. After the Eads Bridge was completed, Cooper rose to prominence as a bridge engineer, published extensively in the technical literature. In one article, he criticized the Firth of Fourth Bridge as the clumsiest structure ever designed by man, and he boasted that American engineers were capable of designing lighter, more elegant structures. Yet, for over 30 years, he never had an opportunity to actually prove his own engineering skills on a historic masterwork like the Fourth Bridge. His opportunity finally arrived in 1887, when the Quebec Bridge Company was incorporated to build a bridge across the St. Lawrence River near Quebec City, Canada. Because of Cooper's stature as America's most respected bridge engineer, he was hired to review the competitive design proposals for the, for the bridge, and he was instrumental in the selection of the Phoenix Bridge Company to do the job.
Cooper was then retained as consulting engineer for the project with responsibility for reviewing and approving the Phoenix company's detailed design drawings and specifications. In this role, Cooper ordered an additional investigation of the bridge site to finalize its overall configuration. The Phoenix company's proposal was for a cantilever bridge with a main span of 1,600 feet, but Cooper now recommended moving each pier 100 feet closer to the shoreline, thus increasing the main span to 1,800 feet. Cooper claimed that the change would reduce cost by simplifying the construction of the pier foundations. However, it's very likely that Cooper also saw this as an opportunity to be the designer of the world's longest span, a title that at that point was still held by the 1,700 foot spans of the Firth of Forth Bridge. As design work began, Canada's Department of Railways and Canals indicated its intent to provide an independent check on all of Cooper's work. Even though this was standard practice, Cooper refused to accept the arrangement, insisting that he was unwilling to assume a subordinate role. The department eventually relented, and Cooper would then have full authority for the design, and of course, he would also be able to assume full credit for the product. Yet, Cooper wasn't really equipped to serve in this role as de facto chief engineer for the bridge. He had no staff at all in his New York City office, and so he couldn't possibly provide an appropriate review of every aspect of this complex design. He had insisted on the chief engineer's status, but ultimately he had little choice but to accept most of the Phoenix Company's design work on faith. Construction of the Quebec Bridge began in 1904. By that time, Cooper was 64 years old and in poor health, so he decided to supervise the work from his New York City office. Over the course of four years, he visited the bridge site only three times. He hired a young engineer named McClure to be his eyes and ears on the site, but McClure lacked the experience to handle a crisis. And unfortunately, a crisis is just what he got. As construction progressed, those two great cantilever arms began to extend out across the river. McClure began noticing that some of the structural members didn't fit as they should have. And then, even more ominously, several compression cords on the bottom of the cantilever arms began to bend sideways. As more weight was added to the arm, that bending increased. What was going on here? Well, you know what it is. Under the action of increasing compression, these elements are beginning to deflect more and more in the lateral direction. It's absolutely clear that these critically important compression cords were buckling. The bridge was effectively collapsing in slow motion right before everyone's eyes and no one recognized it. McClure dutifully reported each of these observations in letters to Cooper, but isolated from the construction site, Cooper was in denial. First, he dismissed those reported deflections as insignificant. Then he suggested that the cords had probably been accidentally bent before they were ever installed on the bridge. On August 28, 1907, McClure traveled to New York to personally communicate the urgency of the situation to Cooper. He arrived the following day and finally managed to convince Cooper that something was seriously awry on the bridge. At 12.16 on that day, Cooper sent a telegram with the following message, add no more load to the bridge till after due consideration of facts. But he sent the telegraph not to Quebec, but to the Phoenix Company's offices in Pennsylvania. He assumed that work had already stopped on the bridge site. The work had not stopped. 86 men were still on the bridge, adding steel to those already overstressed cantilever arms. At 5.30 that afternoon, the whistle signaling the end of the workday had just blown when the workers heard a loud bang, like a cannon shot. And at that point, those overburdened compression cords of the cantilever arm buckled totally and 19,000 tons of steel collapsed onto the banks of the St. Lawrence. Only 11 of the 86 workers survived the fall. So what caused the collapse of the Quebec Bridge? Well, there were several contributing factors, but the brunt of the blame fell on Theodore Cooper. When Cooper had directed that the main span be increased from 1,600 feet to 1,800 feet, the initial estimates of dead load were never adjusted.
even though a longer span would certainly have been heavier. The junior engineers at Phoenix made the error, but Cooper approved the design. And he had insisted on having the last word, so he got it. The failure to adjust the dead load after a 12% increase in the span length of a bridge was an amateurish error that would earn my students a failing grade on their design projects. And if you just followed, followed our discussion of dead loads back in Lecture 9, you wouldn't have made this error either. The Quebec Bridge collapsed and 75 men died because the structure was designed for a dead load substantially less than its actual self-weight. The aftermath of the Qu Quebec Bridge collapse was eerily similar to the aftermath of the Tay Bridge collapse. In both cases, even though the failure was caused primarily by the engineer's negligence, public confidence in the associated structural configuration was shaken. As a result, no new cantilever structures were built in North America for nearly 20 years. Determined to overcome the stigma of the disaster, the Quebec Bridge Company initiated the design and construction of another bridge. And the new design was quite similar to Cooper's original, but far more robust. Some might even say structurally excessive. Once again, in the aftermath of a collapse, the need to rebuild public confidence took priority over cost. The second Quebec Bridge was opened in 1917. And so, a great structure did emerge from the tragedy. Just as Cooper had envisioned, this was the longest bridge span in the world. It held that title for 12 years, and even today it remains the world's longest spanning cantilever bridge. The Quebec Bridge disaster focused attention as never before on the engineer's ethical responsibility to protect the public. To this day, engineering graduates of Canadian universities formally acknowledge this responsibility in a calling of the engineer's ceremony. At the ceremony, they receive an iron ring to be worn on the working hand, which explicitly recalls the Quebec Bridge collapse and reminds those new engineers of the responsibility to exercise due diligence in the performance of their professional duties. So what should we learn from this story of tragedy and triumph? Well, we've seen once again that engineering is an inherently human endeavor one that's profoundly influenced by human aspirations and human creativity, but also by human frailty. Fowler and Baker had the vision to recognize the extraordinary potential in the cantilever configuration and the skills necessary to implement their ideas in a way that assured both technical success and public support. Theodore Cooper, on the other hand, demonstrated hubris worthy of a Greek tragedy, and he paid an awful price for it. Second, these cases suggest some very interesting insights about why structures turn out as they do. Now, students often ask me why a suspension bridge is used in one situation, a truss in another, an arch in another. Why does one bridge use a series of short spans while another uses a single long span? And as you might expect, sometimes these questions have definitive answers based on objective engineering criteria. For example, Today, the suspension bridge is the structural configuration of choice for long spans, anything over about 2,000 feet. In the past few decades, the cable-stayed bridge has become the standard for medium spans in the roughly 500 to 2,000 foot range. And note that this is the span range of the, both the fourth bridge and the Quebec bridge. Arches are typically used in the 200 to 800 foot span range, and for short spans below 250 feet, Beam bridges are the most common choice. But what about trusses, cantilever or otherwise? Well, after the successful completion of the second Quebec Bridge in 1917, there was a gradual resurgence of interest in the cantilever truss form. The Bridge of the Gods over the Columbia River in Oregon, built in 1926, is a very good example of this new generation of cantilevers. Many others were built in succeeding years, and in 1974, the Commodore Barry Bridge near Philadelphia became the longest cantilever bridge in the U.S., with a main span of 1,644 feet. But by that time, the cable stayed bridge was already becoming well-established as the preferred alternative for those medium spans. And so beyond the 1970s, truss bridges in general and Cantilever trusses became increasingly less economically competitive and relatively few new ones were built.
An interesting exception to this rule, though, is the case of twin bridges. For example, the original Crescent City Connection Bridge in New Orleans was built in 1958. But when additional lanes were added to US Route 90 in the 1980s, a twin bridge was built adjacent to the original one to handle that additional traffic. In 1988, when the new structure opened, a cantilever was almost certainly not the most economical alternative for this 1,575 foot span. Yet this largely obsolete cantilever configuration was preserved primarily for aesthetic reasons to match the original bridge, even though there's really nothing particularly appealing about the appearance of the original bridge. So the selection of a bridge configuration isn't always based on objective engineering criteria. Such was certainly the case with the Firth of Fourth Bridge, where Baker and Fowler's decision to use a cantilever was very heavily influenced by public perception, by the need to create a bridge that was fundamentally different than the configuration of the earlier Tay Bridge or the suspension bridge configuration that was favored by the discredited Thomas Bausch. Earlier I suggested that engineering is a fundamentally human endeavor, one that isn't always objectively rational, as we might expect. These cases really just reinforce that point. Next lecture, we'll shift our focus from iron and steel bridges to iron and steel buildings. And while modern engineers normally assume a subordinate role in ordinary building design, we'll see that the engineer's role in structurally demanding buildings like skyscrapers has been every bit as prominent as the engineer's role in bridge design. Until then, thank you. Thank you.